Welcome to The Drop and our Succession Recap Podcast. I'm Osman Faruqi. I'm here with Thomas Mitchell and Meg Watson to break down episode two of Succession's fourth and final season. Hey, Thomas and Meg, want to do karaoke like they do in the movies? I'm always a yes for karaoke. Meg, you and I have actually done karaoke before. I don't know if you remember this. Is that your birthday a few years ago? What did you sing? I can't remember. I do remember it. Give me some credit, (laughs) jeez. Um... I sang a lot of songs because it was my birthday and that's what you get to do. I feel like I always go to Natalie and Bruley is Torn, which is a sad song like Connor, but you know, it it has a better tune, I think, than the one he picked. (laughs) Um, Thomas, what about you? You got a karaoke tune? I do. Uh, Let me take you back to June 1999. Wow. It's a hot one. (laughs) We're seven inches from the midday sun. Uh, smooth, Carlos Santana, Rob Thomas. It's one of the all-time great sing-alongs. Uh, like, just like the ocean. There's just oh. so many good lines. So, yeah, I, I've been known to bust that out. I think uh, if Connor had sung either Torn or Smooth, it would have been a much more fun, energetic uh, karaoke room. Yeah, things would have worked out very differently for everyone. <laughs> Logan would have been happy. <laughs> Logan, the idea of Logan singing New York, New York, as suggested by Kendall, was very, very funny. Um, yeah, mine is Country Roads by John Denver. I have a weird fascination with that song. It's actually quite easy to sing. I don't have a great singing voice. Um, a really uh, bizarre, fascinating, and funny way to end that episode with with uh, Connor singing uh, a, a, a classic song that we're going to share some facts about, I think, later on in, in Oz's Fun Fact Corner, which is temporarily retitled for this episode. But let's get into a bit of a recap of... I think I'm going to get sick of saying this throughout this season. This show is so good. It's writing is so good. I think this was even better than the first episode for me. Before we get into why I think so, let's do a recap of what happened. The structure, I thought, was pretty reminiscent of the first. We're still basically following these two different camps. We've got the siblings on one side with Logan, Tom, and Greg on the other. This episode sort of starts with Shiv, Roman, and Kendall discussing how to revitalize the the Pierce media empire they've just acquired. Then they all go to hang out with Connor at his extremely grim wedding rehearsal dinner. He's having a meltdown because Willa, his bride-to-be, appears to have done a runner. She's panicking. Um, Why wouldn't you be if you're about to marry Connor Roy? Um, They end up having a chat, uh, this is Shiv, Roman, and Kendall, discussing whether they want to try and push for a better deal in the Gojo, Waystar, Roko merger, which ends up seeing the return of, I think, one of our faves, Stewie, to this season. While that's going on, Logan is off at ATN. He's firing up the troops. He's delivering a speech to get them G'd up for election coverage. He doesn't care about 3% week-on-week gains. He doesn't care about 15%. He wants to slit the throats of the opposition he's got all sorts of plans. He wants to get rid of Sid. He wants to try and get his assistant, girlfriend, Kerry, on TV. Then he gets a heads up from Connor that the kids are basically plotting to put a spanner in the works, push back on this deal. And he heads off to meet them, leading to that extraordinary karaoke room showdown. Then the episode ends, and I don't want to say it, but I will, with me being right, with Roman uh, clearly alienated from the way that Shiv and Kendall have taken so much joy in in their dad's kind of pleas and begging them to essentially not do this move to push back on the deal. Roman ends up back at his dad's camp, which, for the record, like I said, I predicted last week. What an app. What do you think, Thomas, overall? Uh, I think, firstly, I could have predicted that they would begin this app by you telling us that you were right. So that would have been my... If I, if I had laid that prediction I think, to out, be fair, we all kind of predicted that one. Exactly. So, yeah, some things are very, very obvious. Uh, look, it was it was one of the kind of great succession eps, I think. A absolute stunning return to form. I thought the karaoke scene was, like, possibly one of those scenes that, that people will talk about in years to come, along with, like, you know, Bore on the Floor mm. or other family showdowns. It was, it was succession at its best. All the heavy hitters in one room kind of trading blows and like laying it all out on the line. Uh, And it was nice to get past the context setting up and kind of get the chess game beginning now. Uh, So we see all the pieces, we know where the moves are going to be and and we just get to watch it like play out. Mm. So yeah, I I really enjoyed it way more than week one. Uh, Meg, one of the things we talked about last week was this relationship breakdown between Tom and Shiv and where we thought that was going. At the start of this episode, we get a really fascinating insight into the divorce and it is not going very well. In fact, you'd say it's going pretty acrimoniously. Shiv 
starts this episode off pretty pissed off at the way Tom is handling things. Talk us through what happened and what it sort of suggests about the way their relationship is is heading. Yeah, so one of the first scenes we see when the kids are kind of watching ATN and plotting what they want Pierce to be is Shiv step outside and get a call from her divorce lawyers who are all tied up. They've all been um, conflicted out of uh, representing her, which is an old Logan trick. So Logan's actually been helping Tom kind of tie everyone up and get everyone on side so Shiv has no one to help her, which is pretty a huge step, um, I think for Shiv to see how ruthless Tom can be, but also that Logan's willing to do that for Tom is a big deal. And I think it shows a lot with how far Tom has come as a character. I mean, if you Mm. think back to season one and before they were married, there was a lot of talk about the prenup that he, she was asking him to sign and how he passed it on to his mom. And she said it was like unconscious, (laughs) unconscionable, um, but he was happy to sign it and he was pretty naive back then, but it shows that he's now a bit of a player. He knows what he's entitled to and he's getting on the front foot. Um, obviously Shift doesn't respond well to that. Uh, the whole appeal of her relationship with him, I think, was someone she can trust and know that she's not going to get betrayed by. And again and again, that's not proving to be the case anymore. And it does seem to be the impetus for her to push back on this deal so essentially what's going on is that this this the the gojo merger which we all thought was basically done and dusted at the end of season three is still not closed yet they're getting really close to it it seems like for whatever bizarre clash of scheduling the final board meeting to approve this deal is on the same day as connor's wedding which is about to come up i have no idea who signed off on that and why they couldn't just postpone it by a day but succession is very good and very funny at making huge important events happen at the same time so this looks like do you like... think logan even considered that i don't think connor's wedding's on the family plan. <laughs> <laughs> on the shared google calendar yeah um, i don't think connor has access to the shared google calendar. <laughs> uh, as we get reminded he doesn't he doesn't have a board seat but he has some shares yeah, in yes, this episode, correct. Um, despite being the firstborn and eldest son so yeah so it seems like this is a fait accompli but then we have this really fascinating phone call that shiv makes to Stewie and Sandy. The Sandy thing is so confusing because Sandy in season one was this older guy and now his daughter is effectively just replaced him. And she's, she's also, also named called, Sandy. Also named Sandy. Yeah, I know. It's That's a... I mean, just to make things more... I'm, I struggled to keep up with some of the names in succession anyway, and now there's two Sandys. So. <laughs> um, and and I think they didn't really... They didn't go into detail reminding us, but those guys own a chunk of the company going back to a deal, I think, in the first uh, in the first or second season. And both Sandys have board seats. That's right, as yeah. well as Stewie. Their Correct. Compatriots. So they're, they're basically... That sort of Sandy-Stewie faction is wanting to get the siblings on board to push back against the deal because they think there is some more money to be made from from Lucas Matson, Alexander Skarsgård's character. Shiv has been looped into this, but has originally pushed back on it. But now, after she sees that Tom and her dad have kind of teamed up against her, she's very, very quick to say, I'm on board with this. Send me the numbers and I'll get my siblings on board as well. And it just made me think of that amazing line from Roman in the first episode of the season where he says, you want to screw Tom, you to Kendall want to screw dad. I'm the only one who wants to do a business deal. It's so obvious to me that Shiv is purely motivated by spite here, right? Yeah, completely. Like she's got a a big chip on her shoulder and it's almost like instantaneous after that phone call to Tom, where she figures out that he's stitched up all the best attorneys and, you know, by speaking to seven of them, he like, they're all ruled out from representing her. Uh, She has like a very emotional reaction, which is completely normal, but suddenly she's like, yep, cool. On the phone. You know, call Sandy. She's like, maybe I was too rash in in ignoring your, you know, offer, and and kind of off we go. So that sets the scene. Um, I guess. Meanwhile, do we want to talk about Logan's kind of brave heart speech at ATN? Because that's the other thing we have going on. You know, showing where Logan's head's at. Basically, we have Logan freaky. It's like Tom and Greg's worst nightmare. Essentially, <laughs> Logan like prowling the floor. M- M- he's moseying. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's he's terrifyingly moseying. I think is the way Greg puts it. We have Logan essentially, you know, making himself a presence known on the floor at ATN. You know, there there, it, it kind of felt weirdly like real because he's like. There are terrified employees like sending an email, aware that the CEO is like breathing down their neck, watching them. Uh, 
and he basically says to Tom, look, I want to I want to give a speech. I want to fire these guys up. And this is where I think, you know, I, I actually kind of disagree with Meg. I know that she's flying the flag big time for Tom this season. I don't think he's changed as much as he has, like or as much as he appears to, you know, had. Sorry, let me say For the record, he was my loser last week. <laughs> I don't think he's changed as much as he seems to. Like, he gives a speech, you know, to to kind of introduce Logan, Mm. and it's very, like, limp and weak. He he goes into the numbers. He's like, oh, we're up 3%. And, you know, he kind of struggles to get people to come over and listen Mm. to him. He's got, you know, he's Greg Weiler trying to bring people over. And then Logan gets up and gives this, like, Braveheart-level stirring speech, you know, calling the team pirates. And, you know, they're limp-livered. And it's, it's amazing. And basically, he's like, his, the message is, I'm coming back to ATN. This is going to be my new baby. We're going to, you know, we say it like it is. They're scared of us and we're going to, like, gouge the competition. And everyone's basically, like, you know, rapturous applause at the end. Yeah, and I think I think what this episode helped clarify was something that our non-business minds didn't quite get our heads around last week, was that the plan here is to sell everything but ATN to Gojo. So all the, uh, it kind of almost exactly like the Foxtel sale to Disney, where... Rupert Murdoch kept Fox News, but sort of offloaded the studio empire to the Disney Corporation. But Logan's like, I want to rebuild ATN. I want to make it meaner and lighter and tougher and quicker. Uh, And he has some pretty clear plans. I thought one thing, I mean, I'm sort of mixed a bit in this debate of like, has Tom developed or is he still the classic kind of goofy Tom? I think he's nowhere near as sharp and as ruthless as some of the other characters here. But there are a couple of small and smart things he does. Like when Logan says, check out this build, when, when they're talking about the renovated ATN offices and it's so big and Logan is pretty clear that he's not happy with how much money has been spent. Tom is so quick to say, oh no, Sid loves a lot of space. So Sid is kind of Tom's main nemesis for power within the structure of ATN. And he's so quick to be like, it's actually her. And then by the end of the episode, mm-hmm. sorry, by the end of the episode, Logan has basically announced that Sid's on the way out. It's Tom and him who are going to drive the ATN kind of revitalization. Meg, was there anything else from the kind of ATN plotline here and Logan's, uh, as, as Thomas puts it, Braveheart speech that you thought uh, was worth highlighting? I think it shows how differently him and the kids run businesses which I mean is not news to anyone but to Mm. see them back to back is pretty stark you know he's so hands-on so methodical so focused on the little costs and you know what the broadcast looks like what the strap on the bottom of the tv looks like whereas the kids are just in this room that is so divorced from any kind of newsroom context, just watching TV going, what if we had a channel that was like, what's going on with Africa? <laughs> like, who's the audience for that? What What are we doing here? Whereas Logan, at least as ruthless as he is and how terrible it may be for democracy, but he has a plan and he has an audience and it's just so much smarter. I mean, yeah, he's, he's always going to come in on top in that regard. I think it was also interesting. So the kind of B plot in this one, or I mean, there's so many plots. It's probably the C plot, really, is this story about Kerry, his assistant slash girlfriend, trying to get on to ATN. And that leads to some kind of just really funny slapstick moments. But what I think is the most interesting takeaway from that is as much as he wants to do it, when he realizes that it's not going to be good, Mm. he backs away very quickly. Like, he is still thinking about the business, right? That's his number one. Yeah, he knows that Kerry sucks, <laughs> but he doesn't want to stop, like, <laughs> sleeping with Kerry. So he, he outsources, uh, obviously, to Tom, and he he says so many times. <laughs> Tom I'm not, subcontracts to Greg. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not involved. I'm not involved. Like, Logan doesn't want to bullet her, yeah. so he gives it to Tom, who then naturally, <laughs> as things tend to go in succession, he gives it to Greg, who blows it. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> Kerry, you know... Kerry is basically like, this focus group (laughs) that you're saying doesn't like me is not real, then your life is over. And Greg, once again, is like, I love that the scene ends with Greg telling himself he did a really good job, (laughs) which is no one else is telling Greg that. I mean, he gave it a go right, Meg. Like, I think he he did say the lines and... I couldn't really see it ending any other way. How do you think think Greg slash Tom handled this kind of very awkward, delicate situation? As best as they're prepared to with their skill sets I think Mm. (laughs) I mean yeah Greg's kind of mumbling I did the job like it doesn't need to be pretty but I did it um and I think it you know as much of a pushover as Tom is in those scenes with with Logan it just shows 
how that pa- power dynamic works and the power Logan has as well. I think even the way that those scenes are shot and acted with those like tight close ups and jumping mm. around, you can feel the tension. And I mean, Tom did the best he could. He mm. he was able to read Logan's micro expressions well enough to sense where he needed to go. Mm. Yeah, that's a good do. point. Yeah. I mean, and and uh, Greg does get very unceremoniously directed to fuck off, fuck off by Logan <laughs> when he's talking about the sogginess of the pizza, which is incredible. Like what? <laughs> like the fact that Logan seems for a minute to be quite focused on the pizza situation. Yeah, there's a sog factor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, Tom. It's it's not about the pizza. I thought it was funny that it kind of that that spoke very much to the tone of this episode. Mm. Like, just as you know, Greg was almost like getting into his Gregisms. Logan was just like, "Fuck off, Greg." Yes. Like, there was no, there's no time for like, Greg. Is it's Greg light this episode? There's not a lot of time for him because uh, there's so much else going on. I suppose. Mm. Let's um, let's pivot to Connor and his incredibly depressing rehearsal dinner. I I got to say, I don't totally understand the purpose of rehearsal dinners it, like what are you rehearsing you just it's only for wedding. rich people only rich weddings i've ever been to have rehearsals right you didn't have a rehearsal dinner absolutely not made no. you do you have any experience or thoughts on the concept of rehearsal dinners uh no i guess my friends aren't rich enough <laughs> <laughs> it's it's usually been like a pub meal the night before uh and i mean if this is a rehearsal and it ends with willa and her entire friendship group leaving that is a pretty ominous sign. So that's kind of where the siblings meet Tom. Sorry. It's where the siblings meet Connor. He's sort of all alone drinking red wine on this big, empty, sad table. And he's excited to see them. But very quickly, they just want to talk about business. They make a pretty key mistake here, I think. And I guess I can see why they did it because it leads to this confrontation at the end. They know that Connor is not on their side. He's not part of what he describes the Rebel Alliance. But then they just talk in intimate detail about what's happening. That seems like a pretty big fuck up, Meg. Well, I have a question about that because in the bar, they kind of address, you know, should we break away and talk about it? Is that okay? And Roman's the one who's like, should we loop Connor in here? Mm. He's the one who suggests maybe we can just all talk about it together. And you can read that as, you know, let's be nice to Connor. He's having the most depressing night of his life. Or you can read it as, you know, maybe I want to loop Dad in, but I don't want to be the one who cops the heat. Yeah, and that, and that during that discussion, we also get the text message on Roman's phone from Dad. So there are a few breadcrumbs there that Roman is already sort of, he's not quite as in with the siblings mm. as, as, as it kind of seems on the surface. But it does seem like he still does care about business. That's what's motivating him. We've already seen Shiv sort of pivot away because of her antagonism towards Tom and her dad. And then during this kind of hangout with Connor, we uh, see first Kendall rebuff Stewie. And I think one of the things this show does so well is unlike other shows, one of my pet peeves is when someone gets a text message on a TV show or in a film, it's the first text message they've ever received from that person. There's no chat history, even if they've been married for 30 years. You need to see the thread. You've got to see the thread. And this show (laughs) shows you emails it shows you threads there's been interviews with the with the cast who say when you see us typing on a laptop we are getting emails the producers are sending us emails at that time so we can react in real time and we see uh kendall's text chain with stewie where stewie's basically saying like you know it makes sense this makes sense you should do the deal so we get a sense that he's been being lobbied it's not working until he gets this video call from (laughs) lucas matson who basically says don't you dare blow this up because it will be the end of this deal and that, really interestingly, is what animates him. Why do you think that is, Thomas? Is it because he wants to get, he thinks there's a chance here, or he just wants to piss off his dad? I think, yeah, I think Kendall, no matter how much he, you know, is looking forward to spending his part of the merger money, he's still so driven by everything that his father has done to him, basically since birth. And so when, you know, he obviously clocks from Madsen, mm. okay, this deal could actually blow up, or, mm. or Madsen is worried. Uh, and so that, yeah, that gives him the kind of the nugget to be like, well, hold on, maybe we won't jump in feet first. Mm. Maybe I can kind of start to think about what she's thinking about and maybe we can stall dad and either like, I suppose that it's win-win for Kendall. We get another hundred million, I think he says, or we get, we get more money out of Madsen. We all win or we, you know, derail dad's plans. And that to me is like, you know, Mm. exactly what I need. So yeah, Kendall kind of switches in that moment pretty quickly and he heads back inside and then things really start to kick off. Uh, I thought that was, I loved like 
Succession, as we all know, does phone calls really well. It's probably the best show on TV that mm. does phone calls. But I loved that video call between Kendall and Madsen because Kendall so quickly got down on like the bro level, yeah. and he was like, you know, Madsen was like, oh, I don't respect people that have that sleep well, yeah. and he's like, oh, they talk to me, bro. One eye open. Yeah, open. Yeah, it's just like amazing. Like he's like, Kendall is just the, the biggest chameleon. I love it. Um, so Meg, do you think that like that's right that? Kendall basically, he's not just trying to get more money out now. He doesn't care if this deal blows up because he's seen an opportunity to sort of ruin his dad's grand plans. Or is he trying to trying to just get more money? I don't know. I mean, why does Kendall do anything? I think, <laughs> I think it's probably more from an emotional place. Um, especially, I suppose, he's, he's a guy who has issues with authority, with men in authority. And to get a call like that from Madsen... I think he he responds to that. You know, he's one to poke the bear and he's like, oh, I've touched a nerve here. Let's see how far it can go. Maybe that, you know, he thrives on that kind of antagonism. Mm-hmm. He misses the fight and he sees an opportunity to sort of go mano a mano against a guy like he sees in his league. Yeah, and also, yeah, yeah. Meg's right. Like, Madsen calling him is like a big ego stroke for Kendall. He's like, oh, he's caught some. I mean, like, someone's reached out to me. Mm. Yeah, so- I wasn't aware they've ever spoken before. It's probably a big deal to get the call. Yeah, that's a really good point. So essentially with um, the support of the siblings, the Stewie and Sandy faction have the numbers to stop this deal going ahead. Word of that reaches Logan and his base. He decides he needs to make an intervention. I think this is also really uh, an interesting insight into how strategic his brain is because Kerry, who's there, says, do you want me to call them? I can ream them out. And he says, no, 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 let's go delicate. So his whole thing of I'm going to go there, I'm going to go meet them where they are. I'm going to basically put aside my ego and I'm going to talk to them on their terms is a strategic play. There's nothing genuine. Also, weirdly, I thought proudest moment Logan's had all season. Yeah, they that's have a really some, good They point. have some juice here. He was like, it was seriously the most genuine smile. And it was kind of like what we said last episode, Oz. You know, he was annoyed that their only play was to come up with a really big number. And there was a part of him that was like, okay, smart, tactical mm. move. Like, I'll come to meet you, but also I am proud in my own sick, twisted you know, Logan. It way. was that smile to me reminded me of the smile he gave at the end of season two when Kendall sort of does that press conference. He's like, this is going to screw me over, but I respect it. Finally, my kids are doing something smart. Yeah. They're getting the numbers. Shark to shark. Exactly. Um, yeah, he's a killer. Uh, and then he comes, he rocks up to the Kerrick, he interrupts uh, poor old Connor's extremely bizarre <laughs> Leonard Cohen uh, impersonation. <laughs> and he I get, becomes group therapy pretty quickly. Um, Meg, talk us through this. Like Thomas said at the start, I think a scene that we all remember for a very long time. What did, what did you make of it? Yeah, I agree. I think there's something really special that happens in episodes of Succession where everyone is in one room and there's this kind of stillness that forces them to actually talk about real things. And it happens so rarely if you think of how most episodes of Succession run. It's people running around from city to city. They're on private jets. They're in cabs. They're talking all in separate rooms. They're negotiating who can be in what room. It's so rare we actually get Mm. everyone in one Mm. space. And especially a space that's kind of neutral, as bizarre as it is. <laughs> like you know, a this karaoke bar. room. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's not it's not one of their houses, it's not an office. No one's won that front. Um, it reminded me a lot of the episode Ostolitz in season one, where they all go out to Connor's ranch in mm. New Mexico. Um, which is the same kind of premise. And that was Logan telling everyone he wanted to do family therapy, but it was mm. kind of a PR stunt and everyone got together and it was just total bullshit. He didn't want to talk about anything real. But then, you know, the way these things go when they're all trapped together, it did actually get quite real. And the family revealed certain things about how they were raised and the trauma that they kind of went through growing up. We learned a bit about Logan's history. Um, The end kind of, you see scars on his back from childhood abuse. It's a really heavy episode. I mean, Kendall's in a deep, deep addiction spiral at that point, banging on the windows. Um, it reminded me a lot of that. And there's a lot of parallels as well. That's the first episode uh, where Connor asks Willa to move in with him. Um, it's the episode where Logan tells Shiv that Tom's fathoms beneath her and she's only with him because she doesn't want to get betrayed. It feels like a real full circle moment in this final season. Mm. It was really interesting that when Logan is willing to apologize 
and acknowledge some of the things that he's done, which she wasn't willing to do in that episode. I mean, was he willing? Well, this is this is the question I've got for you guys, is that it seemed to me that every sibling kind of had a different thing they wanted Logan to apologize for. Like, like Roman seemed pretty focused on, at the end of season three, when you kind of did that deal with mum and locked us out of the decision-making, that's the real issue. Whereas Kendall... He's just like, no, no, no. Can we go back to square one and the way that you raised and broke all of us? That's what I think. I think that's so interesting. And that's what I, that was my favorite part of my favorite scene of this episode because it was so revealing as like, it was for the first time in a long time, we saw the Roy family, not as a really wealthy family of like media moguls that we can't relate to, but they were just a family. Mm. And, you know, often it is the oldest child that, bears the brunt of, you know, whatever, if you come from a traumatic background, whatever happens when you're younger. And that that's so Kendall to a T. Like, he quickly goes, like, are you going to apologise for... <laughs> Connor ignoring... is the eldest son. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Connor is the eldest son, but, like, in the, in the proper, you know, real-life siblings. It was like, are you going to apologise for ignoring Connor his whole life? Are you going to apologise for hitting Roman? Are you going to apologise for, you know, locking up Connor's mother? Like, he, he dug into the trauma that he's clearly, like, carried mm. and still carries to this day. Whereas Shiv, who's like the middle child, again, benching Connor, <laughs> is the middle child who, you know, kind of has a chip on her shoulder and has a thing about being overlooked. She's also, you know, the only female in a very, you know, male driven family in a very patriarchal business. Uh, and she is still kind of smarting about the fact that her own father has kind of teamed up with her ex-husband to screw her recently. And then you've got Roman, who is the youngest child and is such a youngest child. And Shiv's actually Shiv's actually the youngest child. Is Roman not the... Oh, that's really interesting. I know, it's really surprising. Because the way that the Dimex play, it is basically like what you're saying. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I yeah. did not know that. Yeah. There you go. You learn something every day. <laughs> Well, that blows my theory up. So, <laughs> but I think, but I think the archetypes are exactly like you describe. I think, mm. yeah, because I mean, Roman really seems like the youngest child, and he, and this is what I think is curious about how the episode episode plays out. He feels like the peacemaker. He's like, you know, are you going to just apologize for the stuff about mum that that really hurt us recently? And if we kind of get through that, then we'll mm. all be okay. Mm. Uh, and even the but fact, but I would he, argue that's a real middle child vibe. The youngest child is the one who's like. The bratty uh, one who doesn't want to, yeah. Yeah, like she really, really wants to talk about her specific problem and the way that she's been hurt, whereas the middle child's like, oh, well, I'm okay. You can hit me. I'm annoying. <laughs> yeah, everything will be okay. The show's writers uh, have also like played with Roman's character in so many different ways. Like mm. if you go back to season one, he had a wife and kids who just disappear mm. from the show very quickly. I think. Yes. So there is a bit of like shape-shifting as they figured out what they can actually do with these sorts of characters. Mm. Um, and it, it's interesting, you, you kind of pulled me up, Thomas, you said, well, did did Logan really apologise? When Roman is saying, like, that thing with my mum, that was that was the real issue, Logan, <laughs> Logan just sort of says what happens. He doesn't say sorry. He's just like, oh, yeah, when I did that thing, I, I ha- guess... I know. thought about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and interestingly, Shiv and... Kendall, they stay pretty solid after that interaction with their dad. They kind of laugh about it. They say that they were really kind of getting off on it a little bit. Seeing their dad beg and squirm was something that made them really happy. But again, like you saw in that first episode of this season, Roman doesn't feel great about it. He feels like this went a bit too far. He doesn't like the fact that they're joking about it. And the episode ends with him making a visit to his dad and essentially being gently brought back into the fold. Logan is stoking his ego by saying, I need to bring you into this conversation with Matson. You and I are going to rebuild ATN. Interestingly, I think what that foreshadows is a bit of tension between Tom and Roman because Tom's under the impression that it's going to be him running ATN. He then has to leave the room. And a very kind of like a scene that sort of reminded me of The Godfather where Logan's sitting there in this big chair with his cardigan and he's just, you know, he's got these rings, he's got the whiskey. He asks Tom quietly to leave and brings in Roman instead and says, it's actually going to be you son um i think that's one thing to watch is that tension um but yeah it seems like none of us were that surprised by the fact that roman ended up back with dad at the end of this app no it seemed like it was kind of had been signposted but i do think that i'm curious about his motivations like whether or not the flip is to simply further his own means and you know win and become the head of atn or kind of like we were talking about given he is a middle child, whether it is a peacemaking thing where he thinks if I can do this and if I can like, maybe this will be the way to get the family back together. Like Mm. if I, if I just show Kendall and Shiv 
that this is where we should be focusing our energies and maybe I have to do it in a back channel way, maybe then this will bring us all back together. So I'm curious as to whether or not his motivations are purely selfish because it's a bit, it's like a very different Roman we've seen this season. Yeah, he, he does seems seem to be the most yeah. yeah, and like he's he's still got his like Roman barbs, but he seems to be kind of like eyes on the prize. He's the least emotional. He's the least kind of vindictive at this point. So I'm curious, and also just on that Godfather thing, I couldn't tell, but like the end credits with the music that played, it kind of sounded like the Godfather thing. Mm. Like, ha- have a listen back, but, yeah, maybe that was, like, a nod to that ending scene. Um, Meg, what do you think? Do you think Roman is in this for himself, or do you think he's just trying to get his beautiful, broken family back together? <laughs> I think both things can be true. And also, I mean, Roman's definitely the least emotional, but he's the most emotionally intelligent. He's mm. the only one who's really seemed to care about what anyone else is feeling. The only one who's, like consoled Schiff about the divorce or worried about Connor or even bothered to want to go to Connor's <laughs> wedding rehearsal dinner. Um, and I think he feels that for his dad as well, which is some of the reason why he maybe went back and met with him at the end of the episode. But also on the flip side of that, the move kind of makes sense. You know, mm. like Logan says, Pierce doesn't make sense for Roman. It's not what he wanted, whether that's old newspapers or even, you know, the more progressive leaning of them. He wanted to be a fire breather, like his dad said. So ATN does kind of make more sense. I think he's in a great spot because he has those options now. He's kind of got every road in front of him and he can choose where he goes. Uh, yeah, and as we've said many times, his siblings are moronic business people and Logan knows how to run a business. So it, it is, again, it's a smart thing for him to do. Um, let's let's talk about one of my favourite segments in this podcast, the favourite lines from each of us. There were, again, so many good ones. I think I'm going to have to cheat and say two. Um, but, Thomas, do you want to kick off? What was your best line? Yes. Uh, lots of good lines. Maybe not as many. Maybe not as – we weren't as richly kind of doled out as episode one. But my first one would go, I also have two. I'm sorry, but one of them comes with a disclaimer. <laughs> uh, Connor saying, I would like to sing one fucking song at karaoke because I've seen it at the movies and nobody ever wants to go. <laughs> and I just thought that was so good because, I mean, A, again, it's like he's never been to karaoke. <laughs> never, it's so he's depressing. Seen it he's seen it on screen. <laughs> and then, so it shows how like out of touch he is. But then at the same time, Karaoke is one of those things that you often suggest to people and people often don't want to go. They're like, oh, I don't know, man. Like, karaoke is fun when you get there, but in theory, it's never that good. Um, what do you reckon is the karaoke movie that he watches? Like, my best best friend. Sorry. Do you think it's my best friend's wedding? I think there's like a rush hour has a karaoke scene. <laughs> yeah, he seems like a rush hour guy. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine him kind of sitting there watching Cameron Diaz belt out whatever she sings in my best friend's wedding. And then the other one Maybe I thought... Maybe Willow wanted to watch it. <laughs> I don't think Willa wants to do anything except kind of cry in bed until her <laughs> arranged marriage. Um, the other one I thought was really funny, and we didn't touch on this yet, but I guess like Kendall's weird kind of like Wall Street Buddhism that he's doing. Um, but when he, he doles out, you know, some kind of Buddhist saying to Roman and Roman says, hey, Buddha, nice Tom Ford. Mm, so good. I thought that was very funny, but it was one thing, and we touched on this uh, earlier or like you and I touched on it off air I do feel like I can't tell if it's chicken or the egg thing but there are certain moments in succession now where I'm like are they writing for the memes like is this are they writing because they know the internet will lap this shit up Mm. and that to me felt like one I was like oh well I'll see that tomorrow on no context succession absolutely yeah it's such an interesting thing about modern tv shows like the white lotus is another good one where I I feel like the writers must know the way that this show is being digested online and I think I think that the balance that they get is so good because maybe there are a couple of those lines that are for us, like for the hungry meme consumers, but it never feels like it's too indulgent on that side of things. Um, Meg, give me your best line. My best line comes from Greg, even though he barely featured in the episode, which is when Logan was terrifyingly moseying around the ATN floor and Greg says, it's like Jaws if everyone in Jaws worked for Jaws. (laughs) (laughs) So given the, that half that sentence is just the word Jaws, it's so good. Mm. Um, <laughs> that was actually my favorite as well, Meg. So I had to go to a backup, um, which is a, a, a line from Roman where he's describing his dad. He's saying he's selling the empire to a 4chan Swede and dishing out jobs for blowies, which is him cutting his dad, Lucas Madsen, and Kerry to shreds in one <laughs> sentence. Um, I also loved Roman's line in the bar where he's talking about the Beatles and he's like... Uh, <laughs> Yo, 
Yoko, your Ringo. Uh, Connor's still Connor, but he won an auction to have a drink with us. <laughs> <laughs> there are there are the lines. There's there's a line in that same scene that is like a almost off mic, like you're not supposed to hear it, but I laughed out loud. It's when Kendall is asking Connor what he wants to drink, and he says, I want a Belgian Weiss beer, but not a Hoe Garden. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? It's so specific. I think he also prefaces that with whatever the common man drinks. <laughs> Just take me to a bar where people have blood in their hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jerry Watch, folks. That was like... Actually, no. I'm going to actually pick that up because Ruby gets mad at me when I don't introduce the segments properly. Sorry. Uh, let's move on to what has quickly become a fan favorite segment, Jerry Watch. We've got a lot of great feedback from our wonderful listeners who are very excited to keep up to date with Jerry's travails. She wasn't in this episode heaps, but her appearances were quite significant. Meg, can you can you talk me through the first the first time we see Jerry in episode two? Yeah, the first time we see Jerry is her getting caught laughing at Carrie's audition tape for ATN with Hugo, which is a pretty beautiful scene. They're laughing and of watching her on the laptop and Logan walks into the room and is clearly aware of what's going on, but not acknowledging it. They slam the laptop shut. The way that Hugo tries to like plug the cable in and turn it in. <laughs> and so it pops good. back up. I've had, everyone knows that tech fear yeah. you've got, yeah. I mean, he clearly should have opened the laptop first and then plugged it. I'm glad you said that. I thought the same thing. Open the laptop calmly, close the window, and then plug the cable. Yeah, but he's a boomer, man. What are you talking about? He's got massive text on his screen. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, that scene goes from bad to worse for Jerry because they're then talking about the potential of doing a photo op with Madsen to kind of seal the Gojo deal. And she's pushing that, you know, Logan should do it. And Logan says, I don't think I should. It's not a good power play. And he kind of reads that as Jerry already being in bed with Madsen, like trying to get on his good side because once the deal goes through, Madsen would be her boss. So she's kind of in this awkward position between two big guys, not quite sure where to go, and it's got Logan offside. And by the end of the episode, uh, Logan's arranging a meeting with Madsen and wants to meet with Hugo and Carl and all those great guys, but he says, no, Jerry. So she's not in a good spot. Do you think, Thomas, that, Jerry is actually already leaning more towards her future with Matson, or is Logan just being a bit paranoid? I think maybe it's a bit of both. Like, I think we know Jerry's smart enough to, mm. you know, she'd be probably making some calls. And, and she's she, a survivor, right? She, she knows how to, like, yeah, outlast. Yeah, exactly. She knows how to, like, stay afloat without putting herself in harm's way. But also, I think it's pretty clear this season from what we've seen that Logan is, you know, there, there is a touch of paranoia to him, and he's second guessing things or he's curious about like who's on his side so you know jerry is such a trusted advisor she's such an important she's i mean she's still ceo so yeah i think as soon as she like showed a glimpse of trying to like maybe maybe rush the deal or maybe make him feel like you know quick let's get this done uh he was very yeah very much like shut that down and now she's on the outer so yeah jerry watch next episode i'm assuming could be really interesting yeah i totally agree um, another fan favorite segment. I, I know it sound, sounds weird me saying that, but generally a lot of people said they loved these segments, which is wonderful. Thank you uh, for listening. And <laughs> Thank you to our parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, specifically your parents. My parents have said nothing about this show. Um, <laughs> My dad thinks I work at Channel 7. Too, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is uh, one we called last week Oz's Fun Fact Corner, but I'm actually turning this one over to you guys because you both have some fun facts that popped up. Meg, uh, do you want to share yours first? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, if you're not prepared for this, you don't have to do it. We can. Um, I can talk briefly about it. I don't have like a whole thing. Yeah, just just tell us the name of the song and what it's about. Sure. Uh, fun fact is not so fun this week because it's extremely depressing <laughs> and it concerns Connor. Oh, it makes <laughs> extremely depressing facts. Yeah, Welcome to sad right. facts. <laughs> Um, so I did not know the song that he was singing and I think I shared that view with the other people in the room at the time. Yeah, no, Uh, I had to like Google the lyrics to figure out what was going on. Yeah, I did the same. Um, and it's a Leonard Cohen song. It's called Famous Blue Raincoat. It's from 1971. Uh, you know, everyone's favorite karaoke banger. (laughs) A classic. (laughs) It's also, I mean, it's not one of Leonard Cohen's most famous songs. It's also a song that he's, um... 
he's actually spoken a lot about how he's not sure he's always got it right. He said that he didn't love the lyrics. He didn't know if he got the tune right. Um, and it's a really unsettling song. It's a great pick for Connor in this current moment. So it, as ambiguous as the meaning of the song kind of is, it generally revolves around this love triangle of this man who's been kind of left by his lover and he thinks she's in the arms of someone else and he's worried if she's going to come back or not. And when she does, there's this line that she returns as nobody's wife, which is pretty damning for the way the episode ends with Willa. Um, And I think it speaks a lot to the insecurities that Connor's feeling over the episode. I mean, you see in the bar, he's (laughs) he's tracking her phone, which is not the factory setting, as Shiv points (laughs) out. (laughs) And he's really... He's really worried that she's going to go off and find someone else. And so much so that he really gets mad at Roman when he's talking about that and kind of pushing that button. Um, And it's telling how much he wears his heart on his sleeve in this song. I mean, the song talks about betrayal and fidelity, a woman coming back and not being your wife and even setting up this little house in the desert like Connor has. It's really sad that he's doing this big emotional plea in front Mm. of his siblings who are just like, what the fuck is this song? Do New yeah. York, New York. <laughs> yeah. um, I, got, I, I got a fun fact, actually, about your depressing fact, Meg. Uh, wonderful producer, Ruby, who makes the episode sound so great, sent me a message saying that, unlike us, she actually knows that song uh, and she can play it on guitar. Oh. So there you go. Maybe at the end of the episode, Ruby, you can just like... Yeah, play it out. Play it out the, yeah. you know, when, it, when we're doing <laughs> the credits. Um, Thomas, you've got another fact that's Connor related. To yes, share. another fact. Maybe slightly more fun hopefully. Uh, So the bar where Connor wants to get in touch with, you know, the common man, the man with blood in his hair and (laughs) dirt under his fingernails and whatever else Connor thinks that everyone does at work in the steel works. I don't know. Uh, So that is actually the Peter McManus Cafe. So that's just off 7th Avenue in New York City. Uh, And as it turns out, the Peter McManus Cafe is, according to its website, the oldest family-run bar in New York City, serving fine food with good spirits since 1936. What is this fact? This is a ridiculous fact. <laughs> no, I thought it was really... Do you work, do you work for this place, Thomas? <laughs> I thought it was really funny that they happened, to sh- <laughs> they happened to shoot this in the oldest family-run bar. I thought that was nice given, you know, this is a show about family mm. and family business. Uh, and you may have seen this bar somewhere before. Really? This is a famous bar. Uh, it's featured in lots of TV shows and movies. So Radio Days, directed by Woody Allen. Highlander, it was in The Other Guys, great film, by Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg. Mm. It's also featured in Seinfeld, Law & Order, Saturday Night Live, and Broad City. So this is a very famous bar that Succession has tapped into. I really like location-related fun facts. I mean, you're banned from Fun Fact Corner. No, I'm going to do it's... another fun fact soon, and it's going to be another location-related fun fact. Um, it is good. No, look, it sounds like they thought about the bar, right? They weren't just like, let's go into Exactly. The it wasn't there. just like, let's go to the bar around the corner. They were like, what's the oldest family-run bar in New York City? And it is naturally the Peter McManus Cafe. Have you been to this? Is that a provable fact? Is that like one of those... Oh, no, it's definitely like Australia's things? best pie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But hey, it's on the website. Their website's really bad and slow. <laughs> like a GeoCity style. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. MS-DOS. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, all right. We're getting to the end of the app, which means we have to rank our winners and losers and go through our running tally. Uh, there's a little bit more consensus from us this time around. Meg, would you like to go first and award your points? Yeah. So this week I gave three points to Tom. Uh, which is controversial because he was my big loser last week. He was, but yeah. I so feel it's an like admission things... again that, again, you're wrong and I was right. Great stuff. <laughs> or it's an admission that, you know, things can change in an episode. <laughs> and writing different. is complex. <laughs> um, but yeah, for all the reasons mentioned with the divorce and the company, I think he's sitting in a good spot. Um, point taken about Roman coming into his turf, though. Um, mm. And for that point, I've given Roman my two points. Um, I think, yeah, he's in a great spot. He can pick what he does next mm. and... He's also coming out of this episode as one of the only real humans, so that's that's worth something. Uh, emotional growth and smart business decisions. We love to see it. Yeah. Um, I threw Connor one point because, you know, Willa came back, and that's a big deal for someone who is a plant that thrives on dead insects in, in the <laughs> desert. So that was so sad, that's that speech. Something. My superpower <laughs> is, is. Not, not needing love. Yeah. <laughs> And also, you know, I mean, he did a tactical play. He tipped off his dad. He won some favor there and he didn't lose his money the next day on his wedding day. So it's something. Uh, My big loser for the app is Shiv. I mean, she doesn't come out great. Even at the end, she's in the cab kind of deciding whether to call Tom, which would make things even worse. So 
she's not doing well. Yeah, Shiv, not to step on you, uh, Thomas, she was all of our losers. Yes, yes, agreed. So we don't need to talk more about that. The only thing I would add was that I found it very funny that, you know, we saw her looking at her phone and she has her husband saved as his full name. <laughs> it's such a, like, Shiv, it's such a Roy thing. What are you saved as in your wife's phone? Uh... I actually don't want to say. It's going so red. This is hilarious. I'm saying. I I've can't had this do conversation this on a podcast. before. My partner is their full name as well. Really? Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. We'll, we'll, I think you got to say. You got to give us a hint. Okay. I'm saved as Scoopy. <laughs> what? It's just a nickname that I've had. Oh, boy. <laughs> There it is. It's here forever. Gosh. Hopefully we can cut this out. Oh my god, we're not cutting this out at all. This is this is in fact we're cutting everything else out. This is the only thing that's gonna be in the episode. Uh, so I gave my losing points to Scoopy, obviously. Uh, no, I also had Shiv as the loser. Uh, and then I I had similar to, to Meg, but I gave Roman my three points mm. because yeah, he basically waltzed out of this episode, you know. He's in the good books with Logan, potentially about to make a move, but I still don't think he's burnt the siblings fully. Um, to me, he was the clear winner, and Tom, two, and Kendall, one. Uh, yeah, I, I was pretty similar to you guys. Tom, three, I just think he's he's winning the divorce. He's he's doing quite well in, in the land of ATN. Uh, Roman, two, he's making the right moves. Greg, I threw my point to him because even though I don't think he's <laughs> anywhere near the throne at the moment, but... He gave it a crack, you know? He gave it a crack. He had a difficult conversation with one of the he most did the terrifying job. people. He did the job. He did the job. Um, a bonus loser award for me from uh, goes to Kerry. Like, just absolutely having her career eviscerated by basically everyone in the show. How did the siblings get that tape that they were watching? Clearly, people, there's like a, a WhatsApp. It's been like an all-star thing, thing, yeah. Going around. <laughs> okay, so our running tally of who is winning. Tom, taking the lead, 11 points. Roman in second place, nine points. Shiv in third on six. Then Kendall, Greg, Kerry, and Connor. That feels right yeah, in terms of so. like where things are going and how characters are developing. Um, we finish up these episodes by talking about our predictions for the week. Meg, you go first. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I know that it's going to be huge and tragic because every wedding in succession is awful (laughs) if you think of season one there was tom and shiv's wedding which ended i mean with the death of a caterer which is not great and also um tom and shiv having a terrible time on their wedding night with shiv asking for an open relationship and then even last season there was their mum's wedding which ended with that horrible betrayal i think connor and willa's wedding has a lot of potential to be even more tragic i mean will is not in good shape i could Mm. see something terrible happening to her i mean is she gonna have a runaway bride thing is she going to die in some awful way is she gonna od on the drugs she got at the aquarium supply store (laughs) i don't know but i mean i'm feeling like she stays i'm feeling like a chaotic speech from her like she'll be like have one too many and then just like lay it all out on the line Mm. yeah i could see that for sure Um, But, I mean, even if she marries him, there's such a quiet tragedy in that that we've seen from her again and again. Choosing to stay in this marriage and make this terrible choice for herself is kind of the most tragic thing she could possibly do. So I think it's going to be a huge ebb, even if Roman and Logan aren't in attendance because they're off with Madsen, which they definitely will be. Yeah, that's basically my thing is I think so Logan and... Roman will be out of the wedding, which will lead to Connor losing his mind. He'll be very upset about that. And I think I think one of this shows kind of, one of the show's ongoing themes and, and, and kind of every relationship points to the same thing, which is that transactional relationships, the ones that have nothing to do with love, are the ones that last and are the ones that are seen as being the most successful on the show. I have a bit of a prediction for what will happen with Willa and Connor. I think they will end up being married, but I think Willa will basically negotiate something extremely specific. I think it'll be, you want this, you want to be happy, I basically want an income and I want my own kind of life to lead. I think that, and that will end up being celebrated and it'll be sort of a bit mournful, but Connor will be stoked and it'll be like, oh, this is the only way that relationships work in the world of succession. Um, Thomas, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're probably right on that. Um... Maybe it'll be like a yeah celebratory vibe once they've nutted out the finer detail, the T's and C's of their marriage. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, as we as you know, Logan kind of preempts to Roman. There is a night of the long knives coming, so they'll be off in. I think it's 
I don't know if they go to Sweden or they go to Norway because I know that they shot season four in Norway. Obviously, I'm obsessed with locations. Yeah. Um, they sh shot season four in Norway. So they'll be off somewhere in Scandinavia doing their thing. My prediction is that Roman will nail it with Madsen and mm. flip, which will lead to Shiv and Kendall to start polling for other board numbers to get like a, to start kind of getting numbers back on their side. Logan has taken their younger brother from them. So they're going to take his older brother from him, which is you and Roy, which is James Cromwell, which is the nice guy from Babe. Yeah. And and he donates to like the environment movement in this show. Yes. Maybe you, you didn't see this, but yesterday I saw Thomas on his screen, I guess in a real Logan way, I was staring at his screen and he just had this graphic of the board of Waystar Royco and he was well, like pointing at it and doing the numbers and adding yeah. it all up. It was, I was like in Minority Report, I had like all these faces up. No, but someone online has built like a fake, well, it's actually amazing, you should all check it out. Someone has built like a fake Waystar corporate website. So it's like this about- is definitely your website. About us and meet the team and stuff. So I was kind of looking at the board members doing the math, which is like there's 12 board members. Uh, but yeah, I, I reckon that you and Roy, uh, mm. James Cromwell is coming back. I think there could be a scramble for numbers mm. in the next couple episodes. That very juicy. Would love that. Love James Cromwell and love the idea of him coming in to screw over his brother. Uh, awesome chat as always, gang. Very excited to do it again next week. Meg, Scoopy. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.